Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash WTech. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Washington Tech Policy Podcast, episode number 12. M- moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast policy with podcast. Joe Miller. Congress wants to know which agencies are using Stingray devices to spy on suspects. All five commissioners face the House Energy and Commerce Committee today. And Michael Scarato is here. All five FCC commissioners will be testifying before the House Energy and Commerce Committee today at 1015 in Rayburn 2123. The Hill reports the grilling will likely focus on procedural issues, net neutrality, online video rules, and the spectrum auction. This will be FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler's ninth appearance before the committee, which is a record. Gigi Sohn, counselor to Tom Wheeler, announced the seven priorities the chairman will be focused on throughout the rest of his term. They include spectrum incentive auctions, lifeline reform and modernization, video competition and retransmission consent, IP transition, privacy, mergers and acquisitions, and public safety. U.S. Judge Robin Cawthron from the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Oklahoma has overturned a verdict against Cox, saying the company duped subscribers into renting set-top boxes as a condition of premium cable service. Brian Fung at The Hill notes the ruling bolsters the ability of cable companies to refuse to offer premium services unless customers pay hundreds of dollars per year for set-top boxes. The Supreme Court decided last week it wouldn't hear an appeal involving the constitutionality of police finding suspects based on cell phone location data. The decision is seen as a defeat of privacy advocates who have pushed the court to overturn U.S. v. Davis, decided earlier this year in the 11th Circuit. That case involved the police using cell phone data to charge a suspect with seven armed robberies. The 11th Circuit Court held the practices were constitutional, comparing the records to video surveillance footage. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has ruled that the International Trade Commission does not have the authority to regulate information traveling over the Internet. ITC typically regulates goods passing over state lines, but in denying ITC's authority, the court noted, quote, there is a fundamental difference between electronic transmissions and material things, end quote. The Hill reports that President Obama posted a message on eBay Main Street and emailed it to 600,000 eBay sellers to persuade them about the benefits of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. TPP is a trade agreement being negotiated between 12 nations along the Pacific, including four nations which are already members, Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand, and Chile, and eight additional countries in negotiations to join the partnership, including the U.S., Australia, Peru, Vietnam, Malaysia, Mexico, Canada, and Japan. The White House is seeking buy-in from the small business and online business communities amidst criticism from the AFL-CIO and other groups that the TPP does not do enough to protect jobs and that the TPP negotiations are being held in private. Economist Joseph Stieglitz objects to TPP provisions that do not protect investors from discriminatory regulations and which give oil companies the ability to sue TPP member countries for their efforts to curb carbon emissions. Democratic Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii introduced the Promoting Unlicensed Spectrum Act to require the FCC to develop a national spectrum strategy to ensure licensed and unlicensed spectrum policies of the future are balanced. The FCC released data on broadband deployment last week from its so-called Form 77 process, which collects data from providers. It provides data on broadband deployment by census tracts. You can find that on the Commission's Form 477 website at FCC.gov. The National Association of Broadcasters released a study showing it would take between 8 and 11 years, costing up to $3 billion to repack the TV spectrum broken up as part of the incentive auctions. The government has said it would take just 39 months, 
and is earmarked just $1.7 billion for the effort. Finally, U.S. Telecom has asked the FCC to place restrictions on John Malone's power over a combined charter Time Warner cable. Malone is charter's largest shareholder. U.S. Telecom wrote that the combined company would make it easier for cable companies to compete against the phone companies U.S. Telecom represents, such as AT&T and Verizon. The NAB has also asked the FCC to delay the merger, asking it to address media ownership rules first. Charter's response to all this was, quote, As the official comment period closes, we are gratified by the support New Charter has received to date from programmers, diversity organizations, business leaders, and members of the communities we serve. New Charter's commitments to provide faster broadband service without data caps, modem fees or contracts, industry-leading interconnection policies, and investing in customer service by returning jobs to the U.S. put the transaction squarely in the public interest, end quote. For you, my dear listeners of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can listen wherever you are and have Bluetooth. You can listen to it in your Uber ride with some mints or on your Thanksgiving morning run or at the gym the weekend after Thanksgiving. How about Super Intelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies by Nick Bostrom? You can download Super Intelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies, or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at audibletrial.com forward slash WTech. My guest today is Michael Scarato. Michael joined the National Hispanic Media Coalition's NHMC's Washington, D.C. policy team in September 2010 when he was hired as a law fellow after being accepted into Georgetown Law's post-JD Public Service Fellowship Program. While in law school, he represented the public interest in media and telecommunications law issues at the Institute for Public Representation, IPR, one of Georgetown's renowned legal clinics, first as a summer research assistant and later as a student in the clinical program. At IPR, he represented clients on issues such as diversifying media ownership, privacy, and protecting children from harmful ads on TV and online. He also served as a delegate in Georgetown Law's Student Bar Association. Michael's previous experience includes internships at the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia and with New Jersey State Assemblywoman, now State Senator, Linda Greenstein. He earned his JD from Georgetown and his BA in political science from New York University. He's currently admitted to practice law in New York and the District of Columbia. The United States has about an $8.7 billion fund that the FCC distributes, and it's known as the Universal Service Fund, and it subsidizes broadband in places around the country where it's unaffordable. So this includes funding for rural areas where the economics make it too expensive to build out broadband to remote areas, the E-rate program, which subsidizes schools and libraries, and a smaller subsidy for build out to rural hospitals and other healthcare facilities in rural areas. Today, we're going to be talking about another aspect of universal service, which is Lifeline, and that deals with subsidies for low-income households. And Michael Scarato from the National Hispanic Media Coalition is here with us to tell us a little bit more about that. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about how you got into this space. You know, what lit the spark for your interest in media and telecom policy here in Washington? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. At one level, it goes back to uh, just being a consumer myself, when I first moved out of my parents' house, the, the battles I had to fight with, uh, with my uh, service providers to get cable or to get internet access, it was always breaking, you know, I was spending hours and hours and hours on the phone or waiting for a tech, and just, you know, there was that feeling of kind of helplessness. Um, knowing that basically I was subject to the whims of this of this large corporation, you know, that I, I wasn't able to switch to another one. There wasn't another one in my area, and I just kind of dealt with it and, and said, okay, well, I guess that's how it is. Fast forward to to law school, and, and towards the end of my time at law school, I, you know, when I was in uh, the Institute for Public Representation, um, that's actually a clinic at, at Georgetown, and so I was actually able to firsthand get a sense of what it meant to practice before the Federal Communications Commission. 
you know, doing media and telecom law and policy, and a light bulb kind of went off, and I realized, hey, there there are folks that can, can kind of fight back on behalf of consumers and and make sure that uh, that policies are fair and, and that companies treat, are treating people right. Uh, you know, I, I I have come to realize that a lot of the issues that we face are are because of the uh, the lack of competition in in these markets, and you know, we we really are sometimes trapped with our companies, meaning that they can charge us what they want and, and, and treat us how they want. And so, you know, one of the things we do at NHMC is try to look for ways to uh, inject more competition. Absolutely. So let's let's jump into Lifeline. So Lifeline, you know, as, as you mentioned at, at the top, it's a, it's a program under the Universal Service Fund. It's actually one of the smaller programs uh, in the Universal Service Fund. And what it does is it provides a modest $9.25 a month subsidy to uh, struggling families Households that are making less than 135% of the federal poverty guidelines, or participating in another federal program like like food stamps. So we're talking about families that are making less, sometimes far less than. Uh, I think the gu- the guideline of 135 poverty for a family of three is $27,000 a year. Um, a number of Lifeline providers have, you know, they they've released some data about their customers and the majority of them across the board you know these are households making less than $15,000 a year so this is really uh, these are the folks among us that are really really struggling the most to to keep food on the table and you know, keep a roof above above their head um and and what the lifeline program does is it tries to eliminate a really tough decision that these families are sometimes forced to make whether or not to pay for communication service by subsidizing the service you know, a family. There, there are a lot of products out there that, that allow a family to get a uh, get free service uh, every month. Actually, have a uh, phone number so that they can call 911 in the event of an emergency, set up child care, you know, receive a number from a potential or receive a uh, interview from a potential employer. Really, uh, you know, uh, receiving this really critical tool, this really critical service, without having to worry about whether or not they can afford it. Now. In this country, unfortunately, you know, there, there's really a divide uh, among people who can afford communication services and, and people that can't. And unfortunately, the folks that tend to find themselves on the wrong side of that divide and not uh, actually take up these services, whether it's voice service or, or uh, even a broadband service, this tends to be people of color, poor people, um, seniors, disabled people, you know, all of these really vulnerable communities that could really use these tools the most. So, you know, the Lifeline program, we really think it's a fantastic program, and, and we're really hopeful that the FCC moves this program to broadband uh, and actually allows customers to, to utilize their, their, their benefit amount to acquire a broadband connection. But how exactly is, is Lifeline funded? Right now, the FCC collects a certain percentage uh, or assesses a certain uh, percent fee collection from from providers on long distance service, long distance voice service that they offer. Uh, oftentimes, that charge is passed on from the providers to the consumers. So many of us, if you look at your 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 uh, your phone bill, you'll see uh, you may see a fee that says universal service fee, and usually it's a few bucks a month. Uh, as I mentioned, Lifeline is one of the smaller universal service fund programs, so the portion of, of, of what, you know, what the average family pays per month into the Lifeline Fund, uh, you know, it's estimated to be less than a dollar a month. And uh, yeah, so again, this is a fee that the FCC collects from providers that's typically passed on to customers. The last thing I'll note, uh, it's not always passed on to customers, actually. There, there are some companies that, that actually don't pass this fee on and, and, and just, just pay it. So it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that, that we, uh, we even see this on our bill. Tell me, what are some of the access and broadband adoption gaps that really kind of jump out around the country um, that if a lifeline fund that applies to broadband uh, would help alleviate? Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we, we do face a pretty stark digital divide in this country, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to broadband adoption, people of color, Latinos in particular, seniors, people with disabilities, folks who, who don't make a lot of money, folks in rural areas, these are all people who, who more often than not find themselves on the wrong side of the digital divide. When it comes to Latinos, um, you know, according to one Pew study that was released a few years ago, only about half of Latinos had 
a broadband connection at home. And that number dropped to about 38% for families that prefer to speak Spanish. So, you know, we're talking uh, about half of half of Latinos, which, you know, it, it's a growing pretty large portion of the population right now, are not actually connected to broadband at home. Um, lower income folks uh, as well, you know, folks making less than $25,000 a year, uh, fewer than half of them have broadband at home. And ac- across the board, when, when you look at the reasons that people don't have broadband, or indeed the reason that people have canceled broadband, cost tends to be the number, the number one factor. Uh, for Latinos, about 41% of Latinos that don't have broadband have identified costs. That's the number one, uh, the number one reason for, uh, for, for that group. For people under 65, cost is the number one reason that, that, that people fail to adopt broadband. For people that have canceled their service, and, and this is actually a, a big problem, and, you know, just to, as an aside, I think people who follow this space, maybe not closely, tend to think that, well, sure, we're, we're slowly moving in the right direction, we're slowly getting more and more folks connected. Unfortunately, if you look at the latest numbers, we seem to have had a slight decline in broadband adoption for folks making less than 25000 a year in the last year that was measured. And so when, when you're talking about folks that are actually dropping that connection, which you know a decline like that would indicate, cost by far outpaces other reasons as the reason that folks are getting offline. So seeing as uh, how important affordability is, to so many of the groups that aren't connected right now, uh, and, and seeing as how Lifeline is the only federal initiative that's designed to hit that affordability barrier to access to communication services for the lowest income folks that we already know are starting to fall offline, uh, we think that this is actually this actually could be a really great fit in terms of trying to get the remaining folks that haven't adopted broadband connected. What are, the, what are some of the uh, the political dynamics around it? Are the, are the telecom companies pushing back on this at all? What are kind of the arguments on both sides of expanding Lifeline versus not expanding it? Or is everyone sort of in agreement? Yeah, so, you know, uh, really, this uh, the idea that Lifeline should be modernized to cover broadband actually – you know, faces some pretty broad support against uh, across different sectors. You know, the civil rights and, and public interest community uh, largely supports this this idea. The, the companies that provide Lifeline service have, have weighed in and said that they support this idea. Larger telecom companies like AT&T have said that, you know, they think it makes sense for the FCC to explore moving the program to broadband. So, you know, anchor institutions um, like New York Public Library, for instance, supports this idea. I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of support for what really is kind of a no-brainer that, you know, this is the last piece of the Universal Service Fund that, that hasn't been modernized to, to fully cover the communication system of our day. And uh, it just makes a lot of sense that, that the FCC ought to make, take steps to do this. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there is a partisan debate around this program. There are some folks on the on the far right who don't appreciate this program and, you know, they tend to track, uh, you know, along the same lines as arguments against other sort of public benefit programs. You know, we shouldn't, you know, they they would say that that this is uh, increasing dependency on on the government and and things like that. And, you know, we we don't really see it that way. We we see Lifeline as being, providing a really important tool and actually being unique in, in that way among among other programs is it provides a tool that people can use to to, to find a job or to improve their their situation, you know, to, to lower health care costs, you know, to get to get a better education, uh, to do all of these things that, you know, would, would make it so that, uh, you know, a family using Lifeline would hopefully one day in short order get off the program because they've used their benefit to, to, to get a better job or to, uh, to get a better education, et cetera. Um, I'll also note, note that, uh, you know, there, there has been some criticism of the program in, in recent years. Um, folks have, have, have been said that, you know, they feel that this program is, is abused. It's filled with fraud and waste. You know, there, there's, a, there's a point to be made that, yes, you know, a few years ago, program was a bit mismanaged. This, this program was expanded under the George W. Bush administration to include wireless service. That was very popular. 
the controls weren't in place to, to deal with that popularity. And indeed, there were companies and, and people that took advantage of the program. Uh, in 2012, the FCC actually made some significant reforms to the program you know, that, that have actually resulted in you know, a, a pretty incredible elimination of, of, of waste, fraud, and abuse. For instance, the FCC put into place a, uh, an accountability database that allows you know, lifeline providers to ping it and, and make sure that a customer isn't getting more than one benefit. People are only allowed, or families are only allowed one, you know, one benefit per month. Uh, and, and that's virtually eliminated duplicates in the program. Uh, and, and in fact, the FCC's reforms, in addition to just the, the sense that the economy is getting better and there are fewer people eligible, has resulted in almost a uh, 25% reduction in, in size of this of this program uh, in the last in the last three years. So the program is actually shrinking. Uh, it's not it's not growing out of control or, or you know or any of these other things that, that folks would indicate. It, it's actually shrinking. And, and you know, frankly, if it's shrinking because people are improving their, their economic condition and are no longer eligible, we think that's a good thing. You know, hopefully one day we won't need this program at all if we can get folks out of poverty. And that would be, uh, that would be a, a, a really good outcome for us. So what types of communities around the country do you think Lifeline is most suited for? Uh, you know, rural, urban, suburban, because r- rural areas are already getting the high cost fund, which is another another term for the fund that applies specifically to rural areas. Should they get some of that Lifeline support as well? And then, you know, also you're seeing folks moving out of the suburbs, kind of that reversal from the original migration, which was to the suburbs, the white flight to the suburbs. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, the, the reverse of folks of, of higher means moving into urban areas and some suburban areas, economies suffering a little bit more than they used to. Um, mm. So do you think, how, how, how do you think about that? How, how does, does Lifeline discriminate in terms of geographical area or is it purely income based? Yeah, I mean, the great thing about Lifeline is that it can reach folks that need it where, wherever they live rural, urban, suburban, because income really is the only, uh, or, or in, income or participation in another uh, government program from a certain list of programs, you know, that's what qualifies somebody to to take the lifeline benefit. So, you know, we think that's a great thing. I mean, the high cost fund has been doing work to help make a business case for providers to build out to rural areas, but the lifeline fund actually goes straight, you know, straight to the customer, straight to the user and helps make that service more affordable on a household by household basis. You know, in rural areas, uh, actually, you know, there's a study that said that uh, rural folks who have access, meaning that where, 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 the, where they can actually get broadband, uh, and more and more rural communities are getting access now, nowadays. You know, for those folks, affordability, once they have access, affordability is the number one mm-hmm. barrier. So, I mean, this seems perfectly suited to, to help folks in rural communities that have access. Uh, and, and indeed, it may help accelerate, you know, the, the benefits that these communities will see. You know, I mean, it, there's a lot of research to show that, uh, you know, once, once broadband gets built out to, to rural communities, that's one thing. But it's really when a certain threshold of people in that community have adopted the broadband, have actually gotten the service. Uh, that you start to see some of these positive economic indicators like uh, you know, more, more uh, lower unemployment rates and, and more jobs in the communities and things like that. So it's, you know, we really see all the Universal Service Fund programs as, as working uh, kind of complementary to one another. And indeed, I think that's, you know, that's, how they, that's how they were designed to, to address various barriers to, to adoption with the understanding that if we can achieve universal service, meaning everybody in this country is connected to the network, uh, and, and indeed, in the 21st century, that network is broadband internet access. Then the whole country will benefit. Uh, you know, from a fe- you know the federal level all the way down to individual communities. So, we think that all these programs have a really important role to play, regardless of where people live. So that's Lifeline. And the other thing I want to ask you about is uh, net neutrality. Can you give us some background on on net neutrality and where we are in the litigation? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, you know, back back in February, the FCC voted to put in place some of the uh, strongest net neutrality rules we've ever had. Um, they were based on, they were really narrowly tailored based on 
you know, a Title II legal authority that makes them enforceable uh, without, you know, and, and certain parts of the statute the FCC decided to forbear from, which means they're not applying them. So they really tailored what they did to make sure that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no negative impacts from, you know, any sort of overregulation. Um, what the rules did is they really just maintained the status quo. They, they make sure that the Internet continues to operate for all of us the way we expect it to operate, where we're, we're, we're really in charge of, you know, what we see and, and where we go and, and how that content is delivered to us. So those rules took effect on, on June 12th. Um, a handful of providers and, and their trade associations uh, had, had sued, and, and they uh, filed a stay request to, to, to uh, try to hold the rules off until after the lawsuits were, were uh, concluded. The court denied that request. So as we speak right now, we do have rules on the books that protect all of us from any sort of harmful practices that our, our uh, providers might, might want to visit upon us. And, uh, you know, we, we, we really support what the FCC did. We think that they, uh, they uh, you know, put out great rules grounded in really sound legal authority with a, with a really great theory uh, that we think these rules, we think these rules will stand up in court and continue to uh, allow the open internet to benefit so many of the communities that we all care about. Absolutely. And folks, you've been listening to Michael Scarato, Vice President of Policy at the National Hispanic Media Coalition, NHMC. Just a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. Michael, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience before we close? Yeah, you know, I, all of these things that I mentioned, from Lifeline to Net Neutrality, all of these really great initiatives and, and great programs that um, are, are really make sure that, you know, our broadband future is bright in this country. Uh, you know, we can't take any of them for granted. And indeed, net neutrality, the rules that, that so many supported, so many fought for, uh, you know, ha- ha- have been coming under attack through kind of backdoor Con- congressional appropriations processes lately, and um, you know we're, we're uh, a handful of members are, are trying to undo the will of, of the people. Lifeline, uh, as I mentioned earlier, faces constant attack, despite really being such a fantastic program. So the only thing I'd urge for folks is don't don't be like me and and and, and uh, you know just kind of accept accept the treatment accept the status quo and, and not get involved in this stuff until uh, you know until years down the line. I mean this is this stuff is it's really easy to follow, really easy to get engaged with, and you know a, a lot of these really great programs and initiatives need all the support and all the help they can get. So good issues for folks to get involved in. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Joe. And you can find Michael on Twitter at Michael Scarato. That concludes episode 12 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I can't do any of this without you, so thank you. If you're new to the podcast, or even if you've been listening for a while, I have a free cheat sheet for all my new email subscribers. And you can find the sign up for that at washingtech.com forward slash cheat sheet. And that cheat sheet is a guide for you to get up to speed on various different policy areas, including cybersecurity, intellectual property, net neutrality, and other areas. It's a quick reference anytime you're preparing for a meeting or writing something you need citations for. That's washingtech.com forward slash cheat sheet. Thanks again to all of you for listening. I'll see you back here next week. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 